Dr. Pablo Blanco from um, the um, National Laboratory of Scientific Computing in Brazil. So he did his uh, engineering degree from the um, National University of um, Madel Plata in Argentina, and his doctoral degree from the um, science doc doctoral degree in science from the um, National Laboratory in Scientific Computing in Brazil. So he's a currently full researcher at the um, LNCC, visiting professor at the um, UNMDP, and associate professor at the um, Catholic University of Petropolis in Brazil. And he's also um, associate dir um, editor of International Journal of Numerical Method in Biomedical Engineering. A lot of us have experience in publishing, so it would be uh, great to hear from him about this exciting research about hemodynamics. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Go back. <laughs> and do it. And do it right now. Yeah, OK. Yeah, probably the other one realized that I was far from, from, from it. So thank you for the, for the reception here at the ABI. It's been quite a, a, good, a, a good time of period for, for nurturing research with many of you. This is a, basically a talk that I have prepared gathering all the developments from the last uh, 12 years. Uh, we found this EMOLAB, Hemodynamics Modeling Laboratory, and this is a national network. I am a co-PI from this network, Medicine Assisted by Scientific Computing uh, in Brazil. So it is really huge, it's an initiative in the direction of applying scientific computing to, to medical problems. Uh, but in this presentation, I will talk about my own line of research. So luckily, I don't need to motivate how scientific computing can benefit medicine. So this I will skip it very quickly. But basically, we are dealing with a complex problem, we want to simulate, basically we are, we are focused on the cardiovascular system, human cardiovascular system. Uh, we have a multi-scale uh, dynamics in time and space that determines the whole state of the system, right? From, from remodeling and reconfiguration, the blood circulation, down to fluid structure interaction, micromechanics, fed backwards <coughs> through the growth mechanisms and the development of disease. So, this is a really complex problem. All of you know that. Uh, the content of this presentation uh, runs along the, the major lines of research at our group, and some of them the, the most recent ones. So we, I will start with 1D modeling, then 3D, and then we are going to see some techniques to be in between 3D and 1D. Uh, I will talk about arterial mechanics and how we can improve arterial mechanics by doing multi-scale uh, multi uh, modeling. And then how we have dealt with some situations uh, in patient-specific uh, patient modeling using imaging data to perform parameter identification and some initiatives we have with some clinicians uh, in Brazil where we are trying to move our models to the, to the operation room. Uh, so this is the, 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 the model of the upper head, the, the, the head, the, the arterial circulation of the head that we were working until 2009. And we made an enterprise on trying to generate the largest vasculature that you can find, taking only the anatomical data, the anatomical knowledge that was out there. And so uh, what we built was a model that the idea is that uh, if an artery was in the anatomical literature, was a, uh, a name in the uh, uh, anatomical, in the, in, the, in the community of the anatomist with the, some well-established convention, then the, the artery should be in the model. This was the criterion. And so this is what we refer to as an anatomically refined or anatomically detailed model. We are, get, we are taking all the knowledge from the anatomy and putting this into some, uh, into some geometrical configuration where we can perform simulations. So 
our hope, the whole point here is to build a model to perform simulations. We bought some, just, this is just a story, we bought a database with the R trees, but the database was so, so nasty that we had to throw it away and we had to construct our own model from scratch. So this was done by a PhD student, actually. No algorithm in building this. So this was made by a PhD student who was an artist. He, he loved to do, to draw in, in his space and he was really skillful at that. And so from the idea was to, to, to merge data, anatomical data, that this is really well described in the literature, and physiological concepts with mathematical models and numerical simulations to give rise to this model on top of which we can perform simulations of blood circulation, transport of species, uh, and so on and so forth. So this is the, basically the, the outcome of this, of this research. So we have thousands of arteries. As I said, if the artery has a name, the, the, same is, the, the, the same goal we are pursuing with the beans. So that's why here you see the, the, blue, the blue vessels are the beans. We are in the first stage of our construction process where we are focusing on the heart and on the brain for the, bean, for the beans. Uh, but we have all the arteries, and here we are focusing on some uh, small-scale vessels, but we have all these small arteries, middle-sized and small arteries in the model. Uh, it supplies blood to territories, to organs, 28 organs around the, across, the, across the body, specific organs, and 118 118, yeah, 16, 116 territories. So this information, for instance, was collected from data, from reconstructive surgery data. They, they mapped these territories just to know where you can cut without damaging the neighbor territories and you can exchange the tissue among the parts of the body. So basically each territory here is supplied by a single major artery or by two major arteries. And this was quite quite well described in the, in the literature. So since we had all these arteries, we could connect these territories, these pieces of, pieces of uh, mus muscles, uh, areas representing muscles, bones, nerves, and, uh, and skin under the concept of territories and then connect to the arteries. So here we have the arteries of the, of the brain the, in the part of the abdominal cavity of the organs, abdominal organs, the spine and the intercostal, inter intercostal vessels. So you can see that this is the limbs. You can see that this is a pretty, a pretty nice atlas, geometrical atlas, which you can use also as a functional atlas. So because we have simulation here, we have blood pressure and flow rate at each one of these, of these vessels. This, this was the, 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 the goal, our goal, right? So the, the physics is accounted for through the one dimensional equations, mass conservation, and conservation of momentum uh, and the behavior of the, of the arterial vessels. Uh, these are the, the standard equations of one dimensional modeling, the Navier Stokes equations in, in, in one diversion. Uh, and we, in this case, we model the peripheral beds using the standard, standard resistive capacitive uh, terminals. So, this is the, the solving this problem is not that trivial because you need to deal with the some hyperbolic problem, which is not actually hyperbolic because you, if you put some viscoelasticity, then you will have some parabolicity in the, some parabolic, uh, parabolic phenomena. But, uh, so we wanted to, to build some fully parallel, uh, fully parallel algorithm that could be able to, to, make, to make runs in some affordable time. So no, nowadays, which it takes, for instance, 30 seconds to perform a simulation of one cardiac cycle in the elastic model and 13 minutes in the viscoelastic model. This is just for you to, to know, to, to see how a small assumption in the model will completely change the amount of time that uh, you spend on solving the model. And this is the best, basically this, this is the best you can get because this, we are running each vessel in this network at its own time step in a fully parallel manner. Uh, so Better than this, it is, uh, it is hard. we can optimize all our code, of course, but th this is the, the kind of uh, cutting edge technique that uh, need, needed to be developed for this uh, challenging model. And because w at some point we wanted to couple with arteriolar networks just to see 
to which extent we could apply our, our solver. And as an outcome, as I said, we can perform simulations of the pressure propagation and the blood, blood flow supply and drainage from the brain or from any other, any other organ. Uh, here we have simulations of the, also of the venous system, as I said before. So we can see the, the waves propagating in the, in the venous system. And this is the kind of thing that physicians never, never uh, watched in their lives. They only watched, they only saw pictures and, and waveforms and they never saw the phenomena going on. So th this was also a nice, a nice way of catching, catching um, professionals from the medical area to do it, to transform them into our partners. Uh, when we were showing straight line models, they just didn't, didn't trust us, basically. So, we, but, this, this, but this is one, one, another reason in our, in our journey that we learned. Uh, so, uh, we could simulate really complex phenomena like coronary steel uh, and subclavian steel. This is basically, you have some occlusion here in, in the subclavian artery. And if you if you exercise your brain, you can you can feel dizziness. You can feel you can faint if, if the if the steel is because your the blood goes to the brain and then goes backwards through the vertebral artery, which is a collateral pathway to reach the arm. Or the same can happen if you if you if you have some some graft. So when when physicians put some graft, they have to evaluate if, if there is some possibility of feeling some ischemia symptoms from moving your arm when you have this condition. Uh, and this is not a trivial condition where basically the vertebral, the vertebral waveform, according to the severity of the stenosis, can flow backwards. So the, the, the blood circulation here is forward to the brain and here is completely backwards. And this is from the literature. So you can see this is in the model and this is from the literature. So you can see that the model captures qualitatively and quantitatively the, this complex phenomena that involves so many arteries in the in, the character, in its characterization. And this is what happens in the graft. If you put some graft in between the intermalmary artery uh, and the, the coronary artery, a distal point in the coronary artery, these are the predictions of the model. And this is what we, ha we have found in the literature. For instance, this is the blood flow, how the blood flow oscillates and how it is, the, it's fun the functioning of a graft is so unstable because it depends on small pressure gradients that it can easily fail. So, and this is what they, they, the physicians see and want to, want to analyze, which is the risk of failure of, the, of a given graft, right? So this kind of model can give you a quantitative approach to characterize this. Another problem in which we applied the, the Aiden model, this model was to analyze a small vessel disease. So the question here was a, a, a neurologist uh, who asked us, okay, which is the pressure at the uh, 40 micron vessels in the brain, at the base of the brain and over the convexity. At the base of the brain you have these arteries which are the lenticular straight arteries. These are the, the arteries that are most likely to rupture and then if you, have a, if you have a stroke it is most likely because these arteries rupture. And so the, the hypothesis was that these arteries were exposed to high pressure in, in the hypertensive patients this was more critical and for the cortex when you go here over the convexity the, the arteries are kind of protected. They are not exposed to such high pressure. Uh, so th this is why they don't rupture because of high pressure. But when they rupture, when there is some disease, what, uh, what the, the physicians uh, see is white matter intensities in the magnetic resonance uh, images. And they diagnose based on the spots blank spots that they see at the images. And they characterize these spots as the same, based on the same etiology. So the etiology is the same, whatever is the, whatever is the location of the blank spots. And then they, they provide some therapy based on these blank spots. But the, the, the issue is that the, a blank spot over the convexity is different from a blank spot at the base of the brain. Because what causes the blank spot is a different mechanism. At the base of the brain, it is because of high pressure, and over the convexity, apparently, it is because of another different uh, degeneration of the, of the arterial vessels. It is not because of high pressure. So we performed simulations here using, using arborizations that we constructed uh, in an automatic way 
to see which was the pressure at the base of the brain and over the convexity, which is here a vessel, a posterior parietal branch of the middle cerebral artery. And there is like 30 millimeters of mercury of difference, even in hypertensive patients, between the pressure at the base of the brain, the same generation of arteries, arteries of 40 microns in diameter, right? And so, this was the first evidence, there was no quantitative evidence that this could be, could be, uh, could be happening in, in humans. Because in rats, you, you cannot test in rats because, because the, 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 br the brain of the rat has a completely different different shapes, so you cannot measure the rat and extrapolate to the, to the human. And so the simulations uh, were the first, uh, the first to, to provide this uh, analysis. And, and this guy who worked for 20 years now started writing editorials how to change therapy based on this. Because basically what happens is that the, if you have these blank spots, then you, are, you start, the, I mean, instead of, um, instead of treating you with, uh, with um, standard uh, drugs for lowering your pressure, your blood pressure, then they, they are working with another kind of drug which low, lowers the pressure but doesn't increase the pressure pulse. And this is because if you increase the pressure pulse, that is what, what happens when you take some beta blocker, uh, at least at the cortex, uh, in these cortical vessels, then you start losing diastolic flow to the brain. And then with the drugs, you trigger another mechanism of cognitive decline because of losing this diastolic flow. So this is the whole consequence that the, 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 the understanding of the pressure at the base of the brain and over the, over the, cortex, over the cortex has. So, and, okay, the pulsatility is also increased at the base of the brain, and these were basically the, the, the therapeutic implications. So basically the, the, the message here was that the lesions in the magnetic resonance imaging should be understood in a differentiated way according to the place they were located. This was the, the, main, the main outcome of this kind of, uh, of, this kind of study. So we, we have worked also with the three-dimensional modeling because we know that many diseases are related to three-dimensional features of the blood flow. Uh, and to do that, you have to provide boundary conditions. But boundary conditions are never known, mostly not known, not known or partially known. Uh, so coupling a 1D model to a 3D, to a 3D one, it's a good strategy to put the, your boundary conditions farther away, right, from the place where you are analyzing. Uh, so we wanted to do this in a, in a black box manner, that is we have one dimensional solvers, three dimensional solvers, and we wanted to, to couple these solvers exchanging information, which is probably exchanging pressure and flow rate uh, signals between the different component, and it didn't matter what kind of component was for each one of these black boxes. The, the fact is that we formulate this coupling problem, which is a dimension system of uh, dimensionally heterogeneous uh, mathematical equations, we formulate this problem just in terms of interface, uh, form, uh, interface variables, like in a domain decomposition approach. So in this case, we used this, the theory of domain decomposition to write this interface equations and then solve these interface equations using some, some numerical method. These, these equations are usually nonlinear because we are dealing with blood flow and blood flow is a nonlinear, is a, uh, governed by nonlinear equations. <laughs> so the, no matter which are the, bound, the, 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 the the assignment of boundary conditions, you can always set up some interface set, set of interface equations. And if we can perform simulations like this, where you don't know which are inlets or which are outlets. You have some, this is a brachial ulnar radial bifurcation with some of the collateral vessels here. So you have like seven, seven, out, uh, seven interfaces between the 1D and the, and the 0D, where you wouldn't know which kind of boundary condition you have to put. So we let the 1D model to provide this information, right? And so these are the out, this is outcome of the simulation. These are pressure in green and flow rate in red. And you can see that the hemodynamics in each of these outlets or inlets is very, very different and very hard to predict beforehand. And then we can get insight about the three dimensional features of the flow because we are solving actually the, the three dimensional, the three dimensional model. 
The same, the same happened for the aorta and the aorta things are more, even more sensitive. If you slightly change your boundary conditions over the branches in the aorta, you get completely different results because the blood flow is extremely sensitive to the pressure, to the, to the pressure differences in the, in the outlets. So putting, again, putting a one dimensional model here, we were working with the, with the simpler one dimensional model. Uh, it is possible again to put this uncertainty in the boundary conditions farther away from the model and perform simulations and perform simulations in time. Uh, and we do this, this can be done in a fully parallel manner in the sense that you have your code for the 3D, which is running in parallel of your 1D code, of your 1D code. And if you have more three-dimensional objects, coupled pieces of, pieces of arteries uh, in the rest of the model, they work fully independently. And so you, you, you have, a more rational approach to <coughs> splitting the problem into, into, into subcomponents, right? We have a component partitioning, and then at each component, you can divide this into pieces and then do some standard, standard mesh partitioning. So, but even in this case, this simulation took one day to be performed, one, two cardiac cycles in a supercomputer. So this is, this is not affordable for doing more complex studies like uncertainty quantification, parameter, parameter identification, or even to, for applications in the clinic. That's why we went back to, the, to our 1D vision and we wanted to develop something which was in between the 1D and the 3D. So we wanted to go close to the 1D but without missing the largest, the, the, the information that it is encoded in the Navier-Stokes equations, in the full Navier-Stokes equations. So the idea was to set up some psychological 1D structures, these are 1D structures, if you cut, if you slice the vessels uh, transversally to the, to the center line, uh, we, have, we, have, we wanted some method that was uh, capable of being applied to patient-specific geometries. It can incorporate fluid structure interaction without too much effort, uh, and basically that can, be, can, can also deal with bifurcations because we are not going to, to, to perform simulations in these kind of structures without accounting for bifurcations. And bifurcations is a tricky, it's a tricky, geometrically tricky object because you have to change your topology. Your, your topology is, uh, needs a special, special treatment there. So basically what we have done is instead of doing some standard finite element meshing here, we started slicing here transversally to the center line the, the, the surface. And so we construct this kind of slabs. These slabs are mapped to some cube. And in this slab, we will, per, we will put some, some polynomial approximation. So it is a really trivial, from, from the complexity point of view, the complexity is really low, is really, really low. And, uh, but it works perfectly. And it hadn't been uh, approached before. So um, here we use like, cubic polynomials to map the, to construct the geometry here, cubic piecewise, cubic over each side of the cube. And as I said, the fields, in this case, the velocity field, you can see here, is approximated with high order, with high order polynomials. So basically, across the, across the center line, we have low order approximation, first order or second order, and in the, the transversal direction, we have high order. High order means four, six, seven, four, six, eight, or 12. Mostly we do it with six. So these, these are generated with eight, with order eight. So the transversal direction is approximated with, with high order. And this is Lagrangian polynomials in the transversal order. And it is a single element in the transversal order. So you don't have, you don't have a, an inner discretization in the transversal direction. Well, just for you to have an idea, this is a whole coronary tree, left coronary tree, where you have the geometry with the fin standard finite element taken from some CT images, and the, the, the geometry of this transversally enriched pipe element method, which is the method. The normal, this is the normalized time. It's the time that you take to that takes you to solve the problem times the number of processors you use. For finite element meshes, we need a large amount of processors in this transversal 
transversally enriched me uh, method, we need a small amount of processors, but the normalized time drops like a by a factor of uh, more than 200. 200, a factor of 200 in this case for, for P4, this is the, the 20, roughly 20, and so on. It grows, uh, obviously. But the idea is that we don't want to perform simulations which, are, which look like, which replace, will replace the 3D. We want to perform simulations with the low order polynomials because we want to be fast and we want to provide some estimate <laughs> of the quantities that, for instance, clinicians want to analyze, like wash shear stress or pressure drops. And this is, for instance, some, some uh, example of the results. These are the wash shear stress maps when you unfold each vessel. So these are the different, this, each column is a vessel. It, they are cut because of the bifurcations. When they, it's a cut, there is a bifurcation. But each column is a vessel, and we unfold the vessel, and we look at as a 2D, as a 2D sheet. So you can see that ba basically the structures are there and it takes, this is finite element and then these are the different approximations. So the, the results are in the order of magnitude of the uncertainty that we, or, or less than the uncertainty that you have in the segmentation of the, of the arteries. And in the conclusions that they are going to take, they are not going to see, the physicians don't want to see, to. Yeah, to know if the wash stress here is 237 d d dinas per centimeter per square centimeter. They want to know that there is a hot spot here followed by a, a blue spot, a red spot followed by a blue spot, and then you have a, gr a huge gradient in the wash stress stress, and this is probably a complicated point. And it is probably interesting to see if there is atherosclerotic plaque associated to, to this pattern, right? So this is something that can speed up research, in, speed up the translation of this kind of uh, technologies, let's say, to the clinic. So we are doing, in fact, we are doing so. This, uh, this is, we are applying this massively for, for, many, for many patients in the analysis of coronary obstructive diseases, which is basically what nowadays people is computing this fractional flow reserve index. Uh, using some supercomputers, and uh, in this case, we are doing it with this, with these models, and they they uh, provide almost a perfect estimate of the FFR, which pro which is provided by the by the full 3D, and we need only 15 minutes per run in a in in a normal in a normal computer. This is a normal computer nowadays, a desktop computer, right, with 40 processors. Uh, we can go further and analyze the, the, the blood flow in the whole vasculature without needing a super solver or a super meshing strategy or a super computer, which is what you needed here with, with, this, kind of, with this kind of geometry 10 years ago. And he, these are, this is the, the time dependent simulation. Here's the pressure and this is the, the, the wash shear stress. And you can see, well, in this case is the geometry from the Aiden model, from our genetic model, but if you have images from, from specific patients, then you, you can analyze the, the, the points where the wash shear stress can be critical, and then you can relate this with cerebral, cerebral, um, cerebral diseases, cerebrovascular diseases. Moving to, to arterial mechanics, we have, we have seen that, as I said before, the three-dimensional models are embedded into a larger system that uh, it is sometimes important to account for fluid structure interaction, the complexity of the, of the constituency of the uh, materials that are, that are in the arterial wall, the fact that the images are not load free, this is an important aspect, the fact that these arteries are uh, with the stresses, which are residual stresses because they grow, because they, they grow a long, uh, a long time, and also the fact that they are, there are uh, external tissues. So and now I will uh, account for, I will address this problem in which uh, the idea is to compute the stress and to analyze the, the stresses. We analyze the, the differences in the stresses when you have some hypothesis in the preconditioning of your tissue. By preconditioning, let's say the following. This is, this is a standard forward problem in which given some reference configuration, you, you apply some loads and then 
you are looking for the deform configuration. This is the standard forward mechanical problem, but this is not the problem that we, are, we, we face in biomechanics, because in my, biomechanics, at least when dealing with vascular structures, you are given some images, which are the data, and this data corresponds to some pressurized artery. And what you want to know is which is the reference configuration when you deflate the artery and when you un unstretch the artery, because arteries are stretched, they are inflated, and yet they have these residual stresses. So the idea is that from images, you have some baseline, baseline domain, and with the baseline domain, you solve this preload, this backward problem to the reference configuration so that you can know which are the stresses that are providing equilibrium at this baseline configuration. And only when you did this, then you can go forward and perform fluid structure, fluid structure interaction analysis, for instance. So we did this for a simple piece of the carotid artery. This is a piece of the common carotid artery. Uh, and the idea was to test the different the, the stresses, to study the, st the stresses in this vessel when you consider the tethering forces that correspond to some stretch, pre-stretch, or when you disregard the forces, the tethering forces. And in both cases, we will have a pressurized vessel. And you can, you can see that the geometry, the, this is the reference configuration, change, changes completely. And this conditions your, your the outcome of your forward simulations, the simulation that you will perform on top of this, on top of this reference domain. Because for instance, the, the stresses, these are, these are the von Mises stresses in, in the two scenarios, but the stresses vary differing by 200%. So if, if you want to put some growth, growth model or some damage model to understand how the mechanic, how, how these stresses will provide, provoke some rupture in the tissue, then the rupture is, means nothing if you, if, you, if you have this kind of, this kind of variability. So the understanding which are the, the, the conditions, the, the, the preconditions uh, in some vessel are, uh, are substantially important so you can have some reliable stresses. So this was a sensitivity analysis to show how this hypothesis impacted into, into the characterization of the stress field. Go moving downwards with the characterization of the tissue, we know that when we look at the, at the, arterial, at the arterial vessel, this is basically a fibrous tissue. And the, in this case, we have the endothelium, the media, and the intima, and this is a fairly complex uh, structure, which when ruptures, it, <coughs> here you, you see the uh, elastin and the collagen fibers, when ruptures, there are very complex mechanisms uh, going on there. So the idea was try to model or try to develop, actually develop some tools to model this problem. So we are dealing with fibers here, but we want to analyze this, how these fibers transform into some continuum model. So when these fibers deteriorate and rupture, you will have some macroscopic model that accounts for this, for the, this micromechanical interactions. So basically this is the, this is the, the setting. We have some continuum, continuum uh, here and at each point of this continuum you, you have some fibers and these fibers can interact uh, among, other, um, among each other. There is no ground substance here. These are just fibers, this, this empty space around the fibers. Uh, so the idea is that given some, given some uh, deformation measure, we want to retrieve from the, the for, for, given a deformation, we want to perform a computational experiment and then we want to retrieve some stress measure. This was the whole point. And how this stress measure changes when, when these fibers start to, start to deteriorate. So th this was a problem that had not been addressed, the rupture of these tissues fibers and the homogenization problem. This was this, this problem. So basically, this, these are the mathematical models we are using. This basically, this tells you that the, 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 ener the energy or the power at the macro scale must, be, must equal the power at the micro scale. So here we have the microscopic piola kirchhoff stress and the strain, and here we have the stresses that are developed at each fiber, and here we have the, 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 the summation over all the fibers. So basically, this is the, the kind of uh, 
outcome from the model, we have the homogenization of the stress. This is what we have to post-process to compute the homogenized response. And this is the equilibrium problem written in variational form. This s, small s, are the stresses, the forces in each fiber, in each of the fibers. So we can take, for instance, a very simple, a very simple uh, energy function like this quadratic. We will render a linear, a linear uh, stress model. Uh, a very simple structure with some recruitment distribution. This is some information that can be extracted from, from experiments, as, such as the orientation. is also another parameter that can be extracted from, from experiments. And we put some damage, very, very simple damage model. So this, this basically says that when the fibers absorb a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of energy, then they damage. When they go <laughs> over that threshold, they will deteriorate. And this is what we get just by, for instance, this is, we are tearing the tissue and then we provoke the, the, the rupture. So the, the, only the fact that we want to homogenize this behavior was a, a a problem from the setting of the of the mechanical model. Uh, in this case, we have also we have uh, just uh, removed some fibers to to provoke to generate some heterogeneity in the model, so that we can generate the rupture in different in different patterns. So we randomly remove fibers here and fibers here. So statistically, they have the same the same distribution of everything. And the the only thing is that th these are two realizations. But the change in the, in the way the tissue behaves is quite, quite different. So the, the idea is that with this kind of models, we can feed macroscopic models of continua to integrate this rupture of fibers at the micro scale into the macroscopic, into a macroscopic model. Well, now uh, going to more uh, applications. This is uh, an uh, imaging modality called intravascular ultrasound. Some of you may, may know it. Uh, basically, it is a, a pullback of a catheter. This catheter rotates at high velocity and then generates these this cross-sectional images of uh, small vessels like coronary arteries. This is mostly done in, in, in small vessels like coronary arteries to assess the, the amount of uh, ather atherosclerotic plaque into, into these vessels. So and you perform uh, angiography at the same time. So basically, we were interested in, in analyzing the motion of these vessels. This was part of Gonzalo's, Gonzalo's PhD uh, thesis. We are interested in uh, analyzing the motion of these structures and how to, to feed with this motion mechanical models so, do, so we can, so we can in, uh, invert the problem and estimate parameters in an in vivo manner. So the, the whole point here is that we can do this in vivo. This is, uh, uh, we, we know the pressure here <laughs> for the different phases. And so basically, firstly, we have to, we have to gate these images because as the pullback goes on, the heart is beating and so you have, and the heart is beating and the heart is moving forward and backward at the same time within the arteries. So we have to accommodate this data. So that, that means that first we have to gate it. We have to identify the different phases from the cardiac phases. Uh, and to, we have to discriminate what is a diastolic phase, what is a systolic phase, and what is in between. So this is the first, the first stage. Then we have to register. That is, we have to remove motion artifacts. Because, because of these longitudinal motions and the transversal motions, the catheter is a, some free kind of loosely, loosely tightened uh, uh, cord within the vessel. So the catheter goes, goes hitting the, the walls and moving around within the vessel. So you have rigid motions. And then after that, we have to track the different phases among them. That is, we have to create some uh, registration, some displacement field from one phase to the other ones, such that we can feed with this information our, to our mechanical models, and we can try to invert and say which are the material parameters that give you this pattern, this motion, right? So this, this was the, 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 the whole process. Uh, to do that, we used some sequential data simulation methods, like, like the uh, Kalman filter. Uh, basically, with the Kalman filter, you, you want to minimize 
the, the, the square error with the with U OF. OF is the the data we acquired. This is this data. So in this case, we consider pre-stretch and preload because these arteries are in vivo, so they are pre-stretched with some pre-stretch that we assume we postulated. This was some some preliminary uh, toy problem, and with some preload according to the pressure that was known. And we analyzed the, the, the model with a given a given material a material model, and we consider external tissue. And this was a, a major a major change in, change in the in the in this analysis, because when you don't consider external tissue, you only inflate. So your model will will predict this, while your true your measures behave like this. That, that there is nothing to that, that, there is. No use. You, you will not be able to reproduce with this kind of boundary conditions this behavior. So basically, we feed back the model with this data in the, over the boundary. Over the boundary, we prescribe the data extracted from the, from the displacement. And then the prescription, this is our model now. And it behaves more similarly to the, to the ground truth, to, to the measures extracted from the, from the images. OK, we, we identify some parameters that were in the range uh, of normal parameters uh, measured in ex vivo in, in for this kind of vessels, for these uh, coronary arteries. In this case, this was the, the, we divided only in six sextants. And in each sextant, we estimated one parameter. So the, this was basically the, 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 how we set up the, the problem. But the, the, this is not to be analyzed in detail. The, the idea was to blend, to blend these kind of images with mechanical models to perform inverse uh, parameter identification. Uh, finally, to, to the clinic, we are trying to uh, develop, or at, at first, we are starting with this FFR, which is the, let's say, the, 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 the Everybody is trying to compute this number and to estimate this number. You, you, you must know that there are companies uh, funded uh, on top of this problem. The idea is that you replace some catheter measurements. So basically, FFR is measured with a catheter that is placed and it measures pressure distal to some occlusion and proximal to some occlusion. And then it computes the ratio of this pressure. If this ratio is below 0 0.8, then uh, the physician is supposed to make some decision. Otherwise, it makes another different de decision. So it is a threshold. Uh, and the idea is to replace this with numerical simulations. First, the, well, we do this. But we have done this comparing CT and IVOS, two images, two images for the same patient. And this also was some uh, new study because it compared sensitivity to the, to the modality. In this case, we imaged the same patients with these two modalities. And we constructed the models and performed the simulations. We, we have seen that there are some cases where both, both predictions, the predictions of both models were pretty consistent, but in some other cases were not. So this model lacked a lot of uh, uh, anatomical ref definition in the vessels for some patients where some artifacts, some artifacts appeared. But you, you could see these artifacts only when you saw this, the, the different results in the simulation. Oh, sorry. Only when, when, you, when you saw the, the different results from the simulation, a priori, you, you had no clue that there was an, an, artifact, an artifact there. So basically, we clusterized this in two, in two groups. In two groups. And uh, one where the, the CT simulations were reliable, because the IVOS is taken as the ground truth where you have more definition on the lumen. Uh, you have like a 16 micron definition of, a, of, a, of your lumen. Uh, and you have the side branches. And the side branches is another important factor in some cases. Here, here you can see, you can have some like 10 branches. And these 10 branches are not seen in this kind of imaging. For given, the, in this case, of course, the, this is one single vessel of all the vessels that you have here, okay? So 
this is the vessel, this is the, the, the anterior, this is the vessel we are analyzing here, and this has a lot of detail, a lot of branches. So we are moving towards the direction of computing this FFR using IBUS, and this is what, uh, in which we are kind of uh, uh, new, uh, because everybody computes using uh, computer tomography. So here we compare invasive, invasive measurements with the simulations, right? And we, we perform some statistical analysis and measures measurements of accuracy and specificity sensitivity for, for a, a moderate set of patients. So this is the, the, the accuracy, how it outperforms the, the diagnostic capability of uh, the traditional, traditional uh, protocols, traditional diagnostic tools they have. Uh, one is the minimal lumen, the, the minimal lumen area seen in the in the IBUS. The the blue one and the the yellow one is the the stenosis seen in the angiography. Of course, we we moved uh, we used the, our expertise to construct one-dimensional models instead of uh, running 3D, and we are currently using this 1D enriched uh, one, 1D enriched methods. But this, basically, this is telling us, this is our practical proposal, this is telling us that we can compute with 1D and with 3D and we can have some, some uh, the, same, the same, roughly the same predictions using one-dimensional models. So uh, they are clustered here because physicians, physicians gave us some, some uh, patients who were dubious, so that's why we don't have points over here, because over here, you already, the physician already knows that the patient needs to be needs some uh, procedure because if the point is here, if the patient is around here, then it means that the, there is the, a huge pressure drop in the lesion, and then it needs to some it needs some some stenting procedure to open the artery. The question is what happens around this point. So this point is the the troublesome point, and is where the where where the all the methods have the largest. The variability. So the, we are looking for, for a lot of uh, uh, challenges. Uh, organ modeling, we have tools that can be, can be applied to, to, to doing that. Uh, tissue remodeling, we have not worked on this, <coughs> but we have the tools the, from the continuum mechanics uh, and for also from micro, micro, uh, micro mechanics to analyze growth and damage. This is something which uh, there is really, really few uh, contributions in the literature, and I think that that could be also a, a nice. The, it relies also on a hyperbolic system of equations, so the equations that you use to solve the lymphatic system are very similar to the ones you use to solve the the arteriovenous system. You have a lot of uh, uh, you have some other components, but the equations are roughly the same, and we are also developing technology for the, click, for the clinic, such as the navigation in IBUS, data sets, and the calculation of other indexes. Uh, the idea is to, 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 to apply these tools in, in uh, public hospitals there in Brazil. So that's it. Uh, this is the network I have to acknowledge. Uh, so this is empty, if anyone is interested. <laughs> uh, these are uh, the former PhD students and the international network. Uh, and the national network that it is pretty well established so far, but and this visit will, for sure, uh, will add a couple of lines here. So I'm happy. To do that. Thank you for the. from those profiles about local material properties, do you think? I mean, you clearly are able to reconstruct the patterns of deformation, which uh, must be telling you something, I guess. Yeah, the, the first one, sorry. So can the first one, has there been any attempt to combine the, the wall motion with local pressure measurements? With local pressure? Yeah. Well, you, usually the, the pressure is roughly constant in the, in the cross-sectional, the cross-section of the, of the vessel. So, and actually the pressure at that point is, not, is never measured. We measure the pressure, uh, uh, the, the cuff pressure, for instance, and we 
from the cuff pressure, we can estimate the, the intraortic pressure, but along the, the cross section, the pressure is roughly, roughly constant in the cross section. Yes. But the other question that, and we didn't, we didn't make use of it, uh, is the fact that you can see different structures here. So these structures, yeah, these structures that you, we, we, we didn't make use of the structures here, the, the expertise of the physician to segment this. They have tools to, to, to do this. Uh, but the, the idea is that your model will be flexible enough to define these regions. This would be our, our goal because, I, as I said before, probably a blank spot here is not the same as a blank spot here. Does not mean that, that the material is the same, is exactly the same. But the, the, the idea is that this was some camins, if I'm not wrong, a camin segmentation using the texture. So this could be used as a, as a ground, uh, uh, yeah, as the baseline on top of which you will estimate the green, the, sorry, the blue material, the yellow material, and the, and the red material. But this is additional information that can be brought into the model. Here, that, that's why we, we only define this using these six sextants. But this is because we wanted to do it easy and we wanted to have a small, uh, uh, only a few parameters to, to estimate. But sure, uh, also the, the complexity in dealing with the, the complex geometry is, uh, it was another factor, right? Defining complex interfaces here. But I mean, this is the only technical problem, but it can be. When you um, showed the aneurysm flows, were you interfacing your one enhanced 1D with 3D at that point? Or was that all still just a 1D enhanced? In this case, there was, okay. In the case I showed there, it was only 1D enhanced. Because In the aneurysm, yeah. I, for sure, there is no aneurysm here. Because this is the the the, the, the vascular shear of the of our genetic model, but if you have some aneurysm, you can ha you can you you will have to couple the aneurysm with 3D, and the and this model. So, so have you done that? No. Because but, I'm just wondering how difficult is it to couple your high order polynomial 1D method with a full 3D? I think it is uh, more uh, because here you have 3D. So you have 3D information in this, in this model. If I slice here, I have some profile, right? So I can pass this profile to the 3D and I can take back forces and apply these forces here. So in that case, it, is the, the, it has the same dimension for the, for the coupling. I could average and pass averaged information, but I am losing information about, about the profile. I am killing information about the profile, but I, I could do it 3D with like if it were 3D, like if it was 3D, fully 3D. So I, I compute the, the velocity profile, then I pass the velocity profile to the 3D, mapping on the nodes of the 3D, and then going backward with the forces uh, and something like that. But uh, I, I don't see problems in coupling this with the 3D as it is a, a they, they they speak the same the same yeah the same language in, this, in that sense. Because okay, you do have a long you have a much longer. Um, space constant in your 1D direction that you have. You're much more finely resolved in the cross section, isn't it? With all the parameters that you have for that cross section. Yeah, yeah well, we, 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 that's true. We have, a, we have a long definition here, but as you can see, I mean, we, we have, we don't, I, I, I think we don't need such a low definition in the actual direction. Right, yeah, yeah. I, I, I am pretty sure of that. And if, if, if you're, an, we can improve the order in this direction as well, but I, I don't think we need it. No, neither at bifurcations, as, as you saw in uh, as you saw in the in these cases, in these cases, <coughs> even even look at this. This is a small piece between two bifurcations. This is three. This is finite element, and here you have this transversal enriched element. It, it can capture the even the, the hot spot, the hot there. So. Because you will, in the high order polynomials, you will have, uh, because you are solving the Navier-Stokes equations, you will capture the, low, the lowest frequencies of the Navier-Stokes equations. But even if they are low frequencies, 
they are capable of giving much a very fine very fine detail of course if you say okay the stenosis is so so large that you have turbulent flow okay at that point we should go for 3d for the turbulence because this is for moderate Reynolds numbers not so high Reynolds numbers but this would be some some, some limitations but uh, in any case we can couple with the we have seen that uh, we have seen that the pressure that the pressure drop in these arteries towards these vessels uh, uh, this is not small so the 1d probably is under underestimating this so this can also serve to develop improved one-dimensional one models where you, you ch change your friction fun your friction term optimized such that it behaves like this guy this is something yeah the try try to try to see from this try to learn how the velocity profile behaves as a function of the curvature and parameterize this and then create some constitutive law for the friction in 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 one dimensional models yeah i think Robin, thank you for the start. i mean it's quite impressive amount of work it, it looks like you, you have developed one of the missing links for uh taking modeling in a more systemic uh, a more systemic and holistic approach i mean usually you have people working models of different organs but they are not connected and, and it looks like you have the connection but you are looking only at the connection not on the possible uh, multi uh, organ effects of whatever this is comorbidities and things like that obviously I mean, we have already discussed about this connection between the heart and the brain mm -hmm. that you could complete mm -hmm. do you no, or well, this is more a, a historical a historical issue. We, we, I mean, I had back in, there in Brazil. I think this was a circumstantial. There in Brazil, uh, we had some freedom because we were not tied to some to some project. Because I, the, the guy who who did this, the the, the Aiden model, was not tied to to any specific project that I had to 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 to. And milestones and deliverables and so we did what we wanted basically and then when you have this possibility it is great I mean you can do what you what you want and you can do something that probably no one ever did because you had the time and you didn't have to to to, to justify the money you were spending on that that PhD right this is because the scholarship comes from from other mechanism from other financials but so we wanted to construct this link that's that's correct uh without looking at into the specific cases because our goal was okay let's have the the, the first the, the the whole thing and then let's look for for applications and now i i received a lot of in brazil for instance for the kidney we have people interested in in modeling renal physiology but we, we don't have resource, human resources for working on that because of other reasons, <laughs> circumstantial reasons of the, the context back then in Brazil. So uh, it is because of that. So, so that's why, I mean, talking to the people here, I realized that I mean, there is so much uh, potential for, for, for applying this kind of, uh, of, of model. But, and I will, be, I will be happy to, to, to continue to foster this because I think this this should go in, in that direction uh, in, in now addressing specific specific topics which require the connection among among things I mean here uh, now I, I had this contact of this um, uh, neurologist another different neurologist who, who wants to know the pressure the pressure in the different in the different spots of the spine and the spine is a, such a large structure but it is supplied with so small vessels that you have to have the whole vasculature to, to, to know, and it is highly collateralized. So you have to, to have the, the whole thing to understand how the, 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 which would have the watersheds, how the blood reaches the different spots, and these watersheds moves when you have occlusions, or you, you perform some, some, when you do some anal, abdominal aneurysm treatment, then you, can, you, are, you are occluding the adenkiwitz artery, and the adenkiwitz artery is the major supplier of the, of the spine. 25% 
you have 25% of chances of being paraplegic or quadriplegic because uh, the occlusion of that artery if, you, if they put some graft and they occlude that vessel. And so they, they, they do this like looking at the images and seeing if the, if the Adankiewicz artery is going to be occluded when they put the graft, only visually. Like, I mean, like in many problems that you have faced along the years and realized that there, there was no scientific computing helping the, the, these guys treating the patients. But yeah, they, I, 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 agree, I agree with your appreciation. So thanks for a great, great uh, talk. I, um, I was really interested in your unloading of the residual stress um, problem, I guess. And I had a couple of key questions associated with Sure. One is it looked like with the simulation you showed that you end up with a compatible state. And it doesn't need to be compatible, right? You know, when people do yeah. experiments with residual strain, they, they make cuts. To yes. Measure the stress-free configuration. So yes. Well, in the, in these cases, how do you deal with that? in these cases, there is no residual. These are fully unloaded cases with no residual strain. But we have worked with residual stresses in in, in simple uh, in simple geometries with pipes, uh, idealized pipes. And uh, what we have seen is that at some point you can. Estimate the residual stresses from having multiple configurations and unloading them such that you have a compatible, some compatible material configuration which is residually stressed. Yes. So the idea is which are the residual stresses which make some reference state the reference state of a set of deformed configurations. Ima right? You imagine you have two configurations for simplicity. You know these two configurations but you don't know the material one. If you unload this guy, this guy will give you some material one. If you unload this guy, we will give you some other material one. The idea is which are the residual stresses which make these two compatible, right? We did this, if you let me, if you give me one minute, I will show you. Uh, we did this, and the, we found that you can estimate part of the residual stresses. We, we uh, idealized the constitutive modeling using three layers, intima, media, and adventitia. And basically, we could estimate residual stresses at, at, the, uh, at, at the intima and at the media. The adventitia was always being hindered by this is. So the, the adventitia was always being hindered. And this, the, we did this using variational data simulation, using Kalman, sequential Kalman data simulation. And now we are trying with genetic algorithms, and it works. Apparently, with genetic algorithms, it works uh, a lot better than, the, than the, um, the, the other two approaches. So so, Well, uh, actually, in that case, we had to assume the, mater the material properties were known. So therein lies the catch-22. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Actually, you would have to estimate both material properties and residual stresses. This was our, this was our second step. So in this case, the, the idea is that you, you know some, some uh, let's say, the diastolic configuration, and you have different phases uh, according to the load. And you want to know this guy, which is the uh, unloaded configuration with residual stresses, which actually are characterized through residual strains. So we put the problem in terms of residual strains because the problem is nonlinear. So the, the idea, yes, the idea is that which are which are these guy, these guys. So we manufacture the solution. Yes. So these are the problems. So you, do that, you don't necessarily have this compatible state because your residual strains can be anything. Exactly. So our, our material was with some <coughs> incompatible residual, residual strains, right? So it generated residual stresses because of the constitutive equation. We, we assume that the constitutive equation was the same that the constitutive equation you have here. This is another assumption. It may not be the case because the, the residual stresses here may have grown because of a different constitutive equation that it is different from the one that it is 
gives you these different now configurations. Now you have one pressure, the other pressure, the other pressure, and you have this multiple configuration problem. And the idea, this, this is the, the, these are the estimates basically. So the, the, the black one is the target, the manufacturer target in this, in this problem. And the, the other are the, the, the estimates and for different, we have different elements here, as you can see. So here, the, the larger errors are here in the, in the, in the adventitia. This adventitia this is the media, this is the, the intima. And here, in some cases, this is a radial component of the, of the strain, of the strain, yeah? The circumferential component of the strain and the actual component of the strain. So we, we had three parameters per layer. So, and f with more elements, it was more parameters. It's a lot of parameters per layer, right? But the, the idea is that uh, the identif identifiability of the residual stress, the, the residual deformations for intimate media is possible. Uh, at least in this really, of course, here the different, the different, you increase the number of configurations and you increase the chances of, of getting closer to, to, to the solution. So basically this was another, these, these colors, different colors are the, for the different uh, number of the form configurations we consider in our characterization. So yeah, but I had removed these slides because I said, okay, no, this this problem maybe because this problem is really really hard to really hard to solve. Um, I mean, even in one D because this is a one D problem, it takes a lot a, a long time to to converge. Anyway. Okay, let's thank Pablo one more time for his wonderful.